Hello guys, welcome back again to my channel Gamma Die Gamma. So in this video, I am going to uh, prove Bottema's theorem, which is a theorem similar to the one we did before, the one we did in the last video, which was, I believe, Van Aubel's theorem. So it's it's a pretty cool theorem. Proof is short, so you know, should be a great video. Let's get started. Okay, so I'll just briefly go over the construction first because you know we need to know the statement of the theorem that the theorem that we're going to actually prove in this video okay so we actually have a, a triangle now this is not an equilateral triangle and this is important because you know spoiler alert the next video i'm going to make will feature equilateral triangles so this is an arbitrary triangle the only constraint we have on this triangle is the points b and c we're sort of fixing them so the only degree of freedom really is a now we can construct squares from sides d e uh, so from sides a b basically I not not should change that quickly so from sides a b and a c when we do that, we get, we get this square B A E D and F A C G, both of these squares. Now, in these squares, we're going to pick points that are opposite to the, the common vertex A. Now, this is the common vertex A. Point opposite to that in this square is actually going to be D. So we pick D. And similarly here, point opposite to A is actually G. We pick G and then we construct a line joining those points, DG, the yellow line, and we find the midpoint O. Okay, this is the construction. Now, the, now the, here is the claim of the theorem. The claim is that O is independent of A. Well, you know, it's not such an obvious fact because, you know, the only real restriction we have is X and Y, but the degree of freedom is in Z, is in Z right? Z can move up, down, around, anywhere you anywhere you want. But the theorem says that this point O will be fixed in place as if it were pinned to the wall by a nail. So now to prove this, it's, it's kind of has the same spirit as the last video because, you know, we have to find coordinates of point D, coordinates of point G, and then use the midpoint formula. The only catch this time, because, you know, I don't want to be redundant and repetitive, is I'm going to be using complex numbers. And you'll see why they're so neat. Instead of working with a tuple like x, comma y, we're just working with single numbers now. So in, in that spirit, the, the coordinates of a, I'm going to call z. And coordinates of b, I'm going to call x. Coordinates of c, I'm going to call y. And these are all complex numbers. First of all, we can start with the vector uh, B A. Right now, the vector B B A can be found by using again the head minus tail trick, z minus x, and the vector is actually this uh, yellow vector that I've drawn. Again, it's not to scale. If I were to draw it to scale, it would be the entire length A B. Okay, fair enough. Now, vector BD is going to be, vector BD is actually going to be perpendicular to vector BA, right? Now, how do we represent that? Well, it's, it's a rotation of this, of this segment by a 90 degrees in the complex plane, by pi by 2, basically. And the rotation is actually happening counterclockwise. So that angle is positive and a rotation by counterclockwise that preserves the, ma the magnitude here because, you know, the magnitude, this length is the same as this length being a square. It can just be represented by i. There will be i times z minus x because there will be no other scaling factors because, uh, as I said, the magnitude is the same. So we're going to have bd 
which is i times z minus x. Again, these are complex numbers, that's why it works. If it were the method we were using in the last video, it would be a little more tedious than that. Now, to find the, the coordinates of d, we just add the coordinates of b. Because, you know, bd is actually head minus tail as well, being a vector. So, we have coordinates of d, which are going to be just x plus i times z minus x. Now, we repeat this entire algorithm on the right, this right square here. And then once we find g, we will just take the midpoint as discussed. So when we do that, we will have ca going, is going to be z minus y, again, head minus tail, you can check that. cg is going to be, again, now, it's, again, it is, it is orthogonal. So we'll have a factor of i, except the rotation now is actually clockwise, making, giving us a negative rotation. So we'll have a minus i multiplied to the vector ca. So, minus i, z minus y. Hope you understand why we have a minus is because of the Cartesian sign convention that we use when we are rotating on the complex plane again. Now, all we have to do is find coordinates of g, which is, you can do that by adding uh, the coordinates of point c to vector cg. So, y minus i times z minus y okay perfect the last step now the finishing touches finding the coordinates of o which are going to be midpoint theorem so just take the average of the coordinates of uh, d and g i times z minus x plus y minus z all over 2 and then this simplifies nicely to x plus y over 2 plus i times y minus x all over 2. Now you might say, well, how does this prove the claim? Because, you know, there's no more steps that I'm going to do after this. It's because the claim was that O is independent of A. Well, A has coordinates Z and the formula for O does not have the coordinates of O do not have any Z term in it. Now, there's no implicit equation between the x, y, and z because, well, they, we said they were independent and we all, all, also fixed b and c. There was no constraint on the z, on, on point a. So, you know, so there's no dependence or it's independent of z, which, which means it's, you know, independent of point a, basically. And that's it. We are done because... That's all we had to show, was it not? Now, I will actually demonstrate this fact because, you know, it, it, I, I could not do it in the last video, or sort of running out of time. Maybe I'll try to do it in this video and you will sort of see that, you know, if we have B and C fixed and we just keep moving around Z like uh, Z, this point A like crazy, this point O will be invariant under these you know, changes to Z. Now, what we have here is, you know, the same setup. Again, the labeling is different, but I'm using GeoGebra Geometry. It's a, it's a great software, you know, for doing these kinds of constructions and sort of visualizing the theorems for yourself. Earlier, I was actually playing with Pascal's theorem, the one he discovered when he was 16, which is pretty cool. Now, okay, as, as the, you know, the assumption goes, these base points here are fixed and we can only move this point L. And again, I've marked the midpoint with this point. And let's do that. Let's move, let's play with L and see that this is actually invariant. You see, it's invariant. The line around it, the line that's joining the two uh, opposite vertices are actually, is, is actually moving around but you see the point itself is not moving around it may be inside the triangle it may be outside the triangle but overall it is pretty fixed you see like i'm even stretching it to its extremities it's still staying the same the line around it the line that it is on will you know sort of diminish or 
or expand like this but it's still fixed which is pretty cool so you don't need any information about the coordinates of this top vertex of the triangle all you need is information about you know the location of the bottom two vertices and then you get this nice nice point that is invariant under all of them so that's my video guys please uh subscribe to my channel share it with your friends and peace out keep doing math and i'll see you next time